Welcome to Pharmacology for Vocational Nursing 2. This week we're going to talk about coagulation modifier drugs. This is in chapter 26 of your textbook. We have about 37 or so slides in this deck that we'll cover, so it will take us more than one audio lecture. Please be sure that you listen to both. Thank you. Let's get started. To talk about these medications, first of all, we need to understand some of the concepts of hemostasis. Now, hemostasis is a general term for any process that stops bleeding. It's a complex process, and coagulation is hemostasis that occurs due to a physiologic clotting of the blood. There is this complex relationship between the clotting factors or the substances that promote clot formation and either those that inhibit coagulation or dissolve a clot. The clotting factors are activated in a series of sequential steps. This is sometimes referred to as a cascade where each factor serves as a catalyst that amplifies the next reaction. In the next two slides, you'll see this cascade, the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathways. The result is that ultimately we get a fibrin, and that is the clot forming substance. So when we look at these cascades, what we are talking about in terms of the drugs, the coagulation modifier drugs, are drugs that can be used to modify several of the steps in these cascades. So let's start with an overview of the extrinsic pathway. What you'll notice in the extrinsic pathway is that there's an external trauma to the blood vessel. The cells then lining that damaged blood vessel release chemicals that begin the process of hemostasis. They immediately spasm and that limits blood flow to the area. Platelets become very sticky and adhere to the injured area. We get an aggregate or a clumping, and that serves to plug that damaged vessel. Now, when this happens, the blood flow is further slowed, so that we get coagulation or the formation of an insoluble clot. When we look at the cascade in this diagram, you'll notice that there's a red box. When we talk about the medications later on, you'll see that these factors, factor 7, 10, and thrombin, are inactivated by heparin. Vitamin K-dependent clotting factors include 2, 7, 9, and 10. When we look at the intrinsic pathway, you'll see if there's an internal damage to the blood vessels. Thus, when this uh, occurs, you've got the blood that comes into contact then with damaged endothelium or collagen. So the intrinsic pathway, it's actually a slower pathway than the extrinsic pathway in producing thrombin, but the substances released from the damaged tissues actually trigger the extern or extrinsic pathway. So the outcome of these pathways, you'll notice whether it is the intrinsic or the extrinsic, will ultimately find this common final pathway where thrombin enzymatically converts to fibrinogen, and that then converts to fibrin to form that fibrin-bound clot. So in these two pathways that are very necessary for clotting, we could look at them in a test tube. If we were to compare them in a test tube, the intrinsic pathway refers to this coagulation that occurs without the addition of any chemical agents because the clotting factors needed for coagulation are intrinsic to the blood. In the laboratory test tube, however, if we wanted to trigger the extrinsic, extrinsic excuse me, clotting pathway, then we would have the addition of thromboplastin to the sample. So ultimately we'd see that they merge to find that common pathway. So if we look a little deeper into this comparison, the activity through the intrinsic pathway is initiated by the components from the blood and the vasculature. 
So let's back up to the intrinsic pathway just for a moment. And you'll see that this is activated. Now we have factor 7 as a major initiating factor here. This activation occurs when the procoagulant components migrate to the sites of that vascular damage or when the blood is exposed to substances that are released as a result of the damage to the wall of the vascular bed. In contrast then, when we look at the intrinsic pathway, right, we have this pathway that's initiated by the activation of factor 12. That's when blood comes into contact with a foreign surface or a, such as a prosthetic device or it's, there's damaged endothelial blood vessel in the blood vessel, uh, endothelial cells. So once factor uh, 10 is activated, you'll see it here at the fourth step down or in the second step of the extrinsic, once it's activated, then we have that common pathway for clot formation. And that ultimate goal will be that it's converting prothrombin into thrombin. Now, there are several inhibitory processes that limit the clotting. And one of the main regulatory proteins of the clotting cascade is antithrombin 3, which inhibits factors 9, 10, 11, 12, and 2. Two other regulatory proteins are called protein C and protein S, and they have to be present in sufficient amounts because they prevent excessive clot formation by inhibiting factors 5 and 7. If you have a deficiency in any of these proteins, then you have a predisposition to pathologic thrombosis. When we look at the medications that we'll talk about, you'll see the heparin here. You'll see the vitamin K. We'll also talk about the fibrolytic drugs, as well as those the ones that work on the uh, exogenous substances and those that work on the intrinsic pathway. An example is our TPA, our tissue plasminogen activator. And so what it does is this is one that causes a clot to dissolve. So it's a very delicate balance that we're talking about here between hemostasis and hemorrhage. The coagulation modifier drugs are divided into two categories that are big categories. The anticoagulants that inhibit the action or the formation of clotting factors and prevent clot formation or the antiplatelet drugs, which inhibit platelet aggregation and prevent platelet plugs from occurring. We also have the hemorrheologic drugs. These are drugs that alter platelet function. Our thrombolytic drugs, they actually lyse or break down existing clots. And then our antifibrinolytic or our hemostatic drugs we will talk about those. They promote blood coagulation in our patients with disorders like hemophilia. So we're going to break these down and talk to them and talk about them in a little bit more detail. With the anticoagulant drugs, they're also known as antithrombotic drugs, and they have no direct effect on a blood clot that is already formed. They're used prophylactically to prevent clot formation, um, which is called a thrombus. And remember that an embolus is a dislodged clot. You'll sometimes hear the term thromboemboli. So embolization, or the movement, the breaking off and traveling uh, movement of a thrombus to a distant site occurs. And it, if it's stagnant or just sitting there as a thrombus, it obstructs the vessels, and then we have this arterial pressure. So arterial thrombi often form in the setting of other pre-existing arther um, atherosclerosis or other vascular diseases, especially when we have rupturing atherosclerotic plaques. So in the heart, the thrombi can develop on damaged cardiac vessels in a dilated or a heart that's not working right. We call it a dyskinetic heart chamber or where we have a prosthetic valve. Um, 
Sometimes they don't cause problems if they're tiny, but serious consequences can arise if the thrombi then migrate, becomes embolized, or embolization occurs. They usually occur uh, within the lower extremities or show up in the lower extremities as a deep vein thrombosis, or we may see them in the pulmonary circulation as a pulmonary embolism. And when you think about the circulation, it tends to make sense. You can sometimes see where the clot has come from based on where it's gone in the body. So when we have venous thrombi, those are different than arterial. They form in the areas of sluggish blood flow or venous stasis. And they contain primarily these red cells that are held together with fibrin, but only a small amount of platelets are in included in those. So the arterial thrombi, however, they're in that area of high blood flow. So they have lots of pressure. So they have, they're composed of platelets bound with fibrin strands. So the type of thrombus often dictates which type of anticoagulant is prescribed by the provider. The medications that you will see ordered will include, excuse me, things like warfarin sodium or coumadin, enoxaparin or lovinox, heparin, dabigatran, dabigatran or pradaxa, a trix or extra, which is fondaparinux, fondaparinux, um, argotraban or agrotraban. Now, what I would like for you to consider is doing a comparison and contrasting the half-life, onset, and peak times of these anticoagulants. The heparin, enoxaparin, or the lovinox, and the warfarin. I would also encourage you to add epixaban or eliquis and ravaroxaban or xeralto to your list. Let me just fix that real quick. Um, these two medications are the ones that you are going to see more and more frequently. So compare and contrast these and then see if you can figure out why we aren't seeing more of the uh, Eliquis or the Xeralto being ordered as opposed to the Coumadin or the Levinox. As we look at these medications, we know that they are, their mechanism of action varies depending on the drug. And as you could see earlier, they work on different points of the clotting cascade. It's important to remember that anticoagulants do not lyse existing clots. The other uh, thing that you will hear people refer to them as blood thinners. There's actually nothing in the blood that thins it. It doesn't make the blood more thin. It just appears to be more thin because the fibrin's not being developed to, to create the clot. When we look at the indications, they're used to prevent clot formation in certain settings where clot formation is likely, such as those patients with myocardial infarction, unstable angina, atrial fibrillation, if they have indwelling devices, such as a mechanical heart valve, or they've had a major orthopedic surgery. We call these sometimes hypercoagulable states because Patients with hypercoagulable conditions have a tendency to develop a thrombosis. Most often they're venous thrombosis, but it, it can be uh, arterial. So hypercoagulability could be inherited. It can also be acquired. The most common genetic risk factors for hypercoagulability is a factor V Leiden mutation and a prothrombin gene mutation 20210. So what happens in these is that the non-genetic acquired uh, thrombophilia is present and the genetic risk factors then increase the likelihood of a, a vascular thrombus or thromb thromboemboli occurring. So when we look at patients who need these medications, 
obviously the adverse effect, the highest risk is bleeding. And that risk in